but wasn't that a nice introduction? So in this video, we're going to be taking a look at how to control lighting using Python. And when I say control, it's mostly just about turning lights on and off to create a nice kind of animated visual like the one you just saw. This is a project I wanted to try for quite a while, and we haven't done many Python tutorials recently, or like any recently. So I figured it's about time to make some nice artwork using Python, and I'm really, really happy with this lighting rig I've set up. So basically, what this script does is it randomizes the appearance and disappearance of these lights that I've got in the outliner here. So as we're rotating around this character, almost like a music video scene, the lights are kind of flashing on and off. So I can kind of play that here and excuse the denoising. That's why it looks all very messy. But you can kind of see that lights are appearing and disappearing. And one of the interesting things about it is it's not just these ring lights above. If I go into the solid view, you can see that here. Um, there are also these panels which appear and disappear. Now, these ones are interesting because they're actually hidden from the camera, but they are providing some extra red and blue light. We're going to take a look through all of this. So the result of it, if I just bring up the uh, final export here, is that we have the diffused lighting coming from the ring lights there. And then we can see these kind of like the reflections of the blue and red light from the invisible panels that's also kind of affecting the character. I'm so so happy with this setup because just from picking random points in the timeline and seeing what the lighting looks like it looks like a really cool setup for like any situation so whenever I have like a character render in the future I think I'm probably going to use this to like grab some nice renders of them and of course the microphone stand here is just for you know demonstration purposes of like having the context of like a music video. So why do I keep talking about music videos? Well the thing that kind of inspired me to do this was the Sacrifice music video by the weekend. If you watch that music video, there are some parts in it, some very, very short parts where he's kind of standing central on this circular stage and there are kind of lights flashing around. I don't know if I'll be able to show any of it for, you know, like copyright reasons, but it kind of made me think, hmm, how would you animate that or how would you make that? Because if you have, in this case, many, many, many sources of light going around in a ring like this, if you wanted to animate those individually, like appearing and disappearing, it would take ages, hours and hours and hours, like turning them on, turning them off, setting the keyframes for each of them and kind of like assessing how long you want them on for. It just seems like a really tedious task to do manually. And you wouldn't even have much control over it because if you wanted to change that after the fact, you would then have to like adjust them all again for a different style or pacing of the lighting. So this is where Python comes in handy. You may also be able to do this with geometry nodes as well, but you're much, much more limited in terms of logic for what you can do with geometry nodes. So before we get into the Python, let's talk about the structure of the scene. So like I said, it's basically a ring up here. So we've got a couple of cylinder objects, which are basically just making this shell. And inside of this cylindrical shell, we also have these segments, which also originally came from a cylindrical object. And I can just give you a quick demonstration of how that's done. So for example, if we make a cylinder, flatten that out on the z-axis, let's take the top and bottom, inset them, and then we can bridge these. There are a couple of ways to do it. You can press Control E and then go bridge edge loops if you like. There's also the loop tools add-on. And then basically I just pressed Alt and then left click on different loops around this. But if you hold Shift and do that, then you can you know grab a few of them at a time. So like leaving a couple of segments there for extra space. And then you have a few ways of deleting this. Like you know one for example would be just to press Delete and then go to Faces and then you can you know go to the vertex mode and clean up those by adding faces with F. There are probably ways you can keep the faces there while deleting. I don't know, I tend to do things in a bit more of a manual way. Anyway, regardless of which way you do it, you can end up with some segments. And then if you press L while hovering over them, you can select all of the linked geometry. But if you do them one at a time, then you can press P and separate them by the selection, and that makes them individual objects. So that's a way that you can get these kind of individual mesh light pieces. Once you've got all the segments, then uh, if I click on one and go to the material properties, you can see that it's it's been given an emissive material. Let's take a look. And it's extremely simple. It's just an emission shader. If I go into the rendered view, you can see that here, they're all active. So it's giving us a lot of light over this character. Way too much to be sensible, I would say. But you can also control the color from here as well. So we can make that much more orange if we like. If I scrub the timeline, it's going to turn some of them off for me. So that's a really cool thing as well. Like the lighting setup is really, really nice using this ring setup. But even just by changing some of the color, we can get like such different moods. See, that's really cool. That's why I love this so much, because if you watch some of my previous lighting videos, you know, I love playing with emissive lighting and I get really excited just playing with different styles like this. So I'll reset this file quickly. OK, one more thing to show you about the setup is these panels. So these are actually providing some red light again through just a regular emission shader. Uh, the way we hide these 
from the camera is if we go to the object properties tab here in the properties and then go down to the visibility and then under here under ray visibility we have camera and now again I should just clarify that I'm using cycles not EV because in cycles we have much more control over path or ray based lighting which gives us much more accurate kind of emission lighting coming off and especially when using the volumes like I'm doing down here in my world nodes you get these really kind of cool diffusion effects you can see that if I disable the volume here it still looks kind of cool but not as cool you know we like the extra atmospheric going on because it lets the light bleed through the scene and it almost looks like there's a bit of a smoke machine going on just as a side note as well my uh, world nodes might look a bit confusing because this is not a regular node in blender hd orion color background this actually comes from my modular workspaces pack which is an add-on and an asset library i've done a really nice video about that here you can watch i think it's one of my most popular add-ons so far because it kind of really extends how you use the asset browser and then kind of bring in collection assets it's supposed to help speed up your startup workflow in blender but the asset library contained in that package has a bunch of useful world nodes as well and one of them is my preset nodes for having an hdri affecting objects in the scene while also being able to have the world background a different color while also providing volume to the scene so that's what i'm using here but you don't have to use that you can use like a principled volume shader and just plug that straight into the volume and adjust the density however you like it will work functionally exactly the same in terms of volume that is the uh, character model just a basic model comes from my rigged base characters pack you can get that as well i promise i'll try not to advertise my stuff too much but it's going to be difficult because i use my stuff for like everything which brings us on to the python i'm using my <laughs> i'm using my module easy bpy um seriously though so i created this module a while back and it's been contributed to by a bunch of other community members uh, called easy bpy and the, the point behind this module is to just kind of simplify the expression of python interacting with the blender api so you can help to like rapidly prototype workflow tools with python without having to kind of sit through all of these boring code paths like bpy.data or .ops and .do .this .something whatever it's a lot of just like plain english expression i've kind of used a combination here of easy bpy functions and regular blender python api functions which is what i would typically do anyway so this is like a very genuine script for what my kind of workflow would look like so how are we going to build this tool which randomizes the lighting and it kind of gives us an animation we can play through where we can rotate around our character and watch the lights turning on and off so well one extra thing just to keep in mind here is that in my outliner you can see that i've separated things down into collections and there are two very important collections here we have the mesh lights ring and the mesh lights panel Panels. All of the objects in the mesh lights ring are these segmented mesh lights here that I've pointed out to you kind of contained in the cylindrical housing. Strictly speaking, the script will look through and loop through all of these objects. So you can add an indefinite number of objects to this collection. If I wanted to add extra lights to kind of be randomized in the timeline, I would just add them here and it will work automatically. That's fine. Um, so I've separated the panel lights here as well down into their own collection. It works functionally the same way. They don't have to be separated. They could be contained inside of the same collection, but I've just done it for the sake of my own understanding of the organization of this scene. Now we're going to get onto the Python. I've given you enough uh, time to prepare yourself mentally for this. And if this next bit gets a bit confusing, I recommend you check out my Python crash course for Blender. It's a surprisingly popular video. I, I think it's it's one of the videos I'm the most proud of on my channel. I'm very happy with how it turned out. It's helped a lot of people, including some big names in the community. So if you're really serious about learning how to use Python with Blender, then you can do that. There's also a really nice course by um, Sibrin, who's one of the Blender developers. So there's quite a nice amount of content available there if you want to learn more. Okay, so I've got the text editor window open here. And the first thing we do when we're wanting to modify parts of a Blend file using Python is we need to import BP PY, which is the Blender Python API for Blender. This will basically give us access to like all of the core data paths, operators, everything we need to modify the Blend file. The second thing we'll do is we'll grab the EasyBPY module. Now, if you go to my website, curtisold.online slash EasyBPY, there'll be a page on there giving you a general introduction and a breakdown to the module. Over time, I'll be building up a new wiki on Notion to kind of provide you with more information. You can get the module for free on Gumroad and GitHub and for $1 on Blender Market. Once you've obtained it you install it in your user preferences very similar to how the add-ons are installed manually in blender you can also add a modules folder right next to the add-ons one and in there you can put custom modules and once you've done that you can reference them like this in the text editor so this is basically going to give us a bunch of helpful plain english functions which we can use to quickly write scripts and then lastly because we're going to be doing some randomization we're going to do from random import rand int so this function just lets us get integer values which are basically just plain whole numbers 
frames. And the reason we're going to import that is because in the timeline, obviously frames are integers. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. So when we're going to be picking random frames, we're going to need whole number values. Again, for the last time, I apologize if this is going to get a bit confusing for beginners to blender, but this is the final caveat. I'm just going to get on with the breakdown now. So now we've imported our core functions that we're going to use for the Python, but we're going to do a little bit of preparation in the way that we're going to just establish some basic variables that are going to be used throughout the kind of keyframe gathering process. So the first thing I'm going to do is grab the end frame number. So this is going to be important in deciding when we're picking random values for where keyframes should be placed on the timeline, the maximum number of the random value that we can gather. So in this case, it's going to be 900, as we can see down here in the timeline. Now, I believe the way you grab this in the regular Python APIs like bpy.context.scene or something. Let me just double check that. Yeah, so down here in the Python interactive console, bpy.context.scene.frame underscore end. That's a bit of a mouthful. In easy bpy, we have a multi-purpose function called frame underscore end. The reason this is multi-purpose, if I just set up the console down here, is that if we just do frame underscore end without any arguments, it gives us the end frame number. So it does functionally the same thing as this line of code. But if you add a value inside of those parentheses, it will modify the end value. So for example, if I do 500, it's going to change the end value. So it serves two purposes, which makes it very handy. There are a lot of other functions like this in EasyBPY, even for things for like translation, like location. If you do location and brackets, if you put nothing in there, it will give you the location of the selected object. But if you put something in there, it will change its location. So there are a lot of multi-purpose functions like that. We call them like getters and setters because they get information and set information. Anyway, so we've got the end value for the timeline. Now we're gonna have some other really important values for the randomization. So we have phase, minimum and maximum and and sustain a minimum and maximum. So to explain this process, I'm going to um, just open up a shader editor because I'm going to use this as a whiteboard. I'm so glad that the uh, annotation tool is available in Blender. Okay, so what are the words phase? and sustain mean in my code. Very uh, lovely writing you got there, Curtis. When it comes to programming and code in general, there are like a virtually limitless number of ways to do like any particular task. People lose their minds over the efficiency of algorithms, especially like sorting algorithms. So basically when I'm writing this code, I have chosen one particular way of randomizing keyframes and setting them on the timeline. And of course that means I've given it my own vocabulary as well. So imagine this is the timeline. What happens is when we get down to the main piece of code that's going to essentially loop through all of the lights. So for example, imagine that we're looking at the first light. It's going to turn on and turn off that light in phases. Essentially for each light we're going to look at, we're going to start at the beginning of the timeline, which is essentially zero or one, depending on kind of how you think about where it should start. For us, we're considering it zero. It's going to grab a random number, which is going to be the number of frames from the beginning that it should turn the light on. And this is what I call the phase. So it's going to choose a random number to start the phase at. So when we have phase minimum and phase maximum, that's going to be between 0 and 75 frames, as we can see here, and we can adjust those numbers in the code. And then we're going to use the sustain values. So once we know where the phase starts, we need to know how long to sustain it for. So that's between 5 to 100 frames. So that random value is going to pick, you know, a number between 5 and 100 and then end that there. So this is pretty much the phase and this is pretty much the sustain. And then because we're not at the end of the timeline yet, the code is going to enter another phase stage where it's going to give us a random number to decide where the next phase should begin. And then you can see where this is going. Like it's going to give us another random value for the sustain, etc. So this is how it's essentially going to randomize where the lights are going to be placed on and off on the timeline. We're going to see exactly how that works functionally in the code in a little bit. But before we get down to that, we can see, okay, so we've got these random values ready. I've set up a convenience function for randomization. Okay, so this is completely optional. Basically, if I go down to the code here, you can see that when I get random values, I'm just calling R and then in the parentheses, putting the phase minimum and maximum. So give us a random value between this minimum and this maximum. A convenience function is just a function with like a shorthand name that just calls another function. It means that we don't have to type out rand int every time. It just keeps it nice and clean and simple. So that's what I've done here. I've created R, which just calls rand int minimum maximum. Again, convenience, completely optional. 
not necessary. Okay, so before we get our randomly generated keyframes, one thing we need to do is prepare the objects. So by prepare, what I mean is we want to make sure there are no keyframes on them when the script starts, because if we left the keyframes on there, when we go to generate new ones, it's just going to add them on top of the pre-existing keyframes. And of course, like if you run the script like 50 times, you're going to end up with like hundreds or thousands of keyframes stacked on top of each other on those lights, which is not ideal, obviously, because it's just going to make stuff like really flashy and laggy and if you're prone to getting seizures, which if you are, I don't recommend watching this tutorial, but if you are prone to getting seizures, that's going to be a massive problem. So the way we prepare these objects for the script is to, first of all, get a reference to them. So you can see here, to get and prepare the ring lights, which are going to be like these segments along the top there. So rings equals easy BPY function, get objects from collection, and then mesh lights ring. So what this does is it goes to the mesh lights ring collection, grabs all the objects inside of it and puts them in a list, which is now rings. So in one plain English line of code, we can get that easily. And now for each of these objects, we're going to cycle through them and delete their animation data. So for ring in rings, so for every one of these objects, we're going to show in viewport ring. Now, the reason we show it in viewport is because a lot of these operations like this bpy.ops one coming down here, um, they don't work when the object is not active in viewport because for these operations, the object needs to be selected and you can't necessarily select it if it's not active in viewport, if that makes sense. So we need to do these couple of extra lines. So we show it in the viewport, then we select it to true, like we're doing here, and then we can perform this operation. Now I do have an operation in ACBPY for deleting animation data that should make this redundant, but it doesn't work yet or it's not finished yet. So for now, like I said, we're using a combination of the modules. So there's a function here, bpy.ops.anim.keyframe underscore clear underscore v3d. And what that does is if I go and grab it, so clear keyframes and remove animation, it just clears the timeline like that. So we know that for every ring object, we're going to clear the timeline. And again, we do exactly the same thing here for the panel lights. If we had these all in one collection, we wouldn't need two of these. We would just do it like, you know, in, in one go. Okay, so that's fine. Everything's being prepared. Now we get to the main bulk of the code. Damn, I think I lost my diagram timeline, but uh, I'll make it again because this might be useful. So essentially we're making a function to generate the keyframes and then we're calling the function twice. We're calling it once for the rings and then again, obviously once for the panels. Oh wait, the, the diagram comes back if I click on the plane. Is that, oh, it's a different material. That's fine. Interesting. So def, meaning defining a new function, get keyframe and then the argument we're going to give it is lights. So this basically represents the list of objects we're going to be passing that we're going to get random keyframe values on. So you can see down here where we're calling get keyframes, we are passing the rings and the panels, the collections of objects. So rings in this case becomes lights. So for light in lights, so essentially if we have all of the segmented light objects, if I just draw a few of them down here, we are now going to loop through each of these individually. So for each of these lights, imagine we're looking at one of them. First of all, we're going to set its off state. So at the very beginning of the timeline, imagine that the timeline is down here. We're going to hide it in the viewport and hide it in the render. That's how we want it to be, completely off, completely black. And then we're going to insert keyframes to let Blender know that we want it to be off at the very beginning of the timeline. So light, like this, dot keyframe insert. This is how you add a keyframe in Blender. And then in brackets, we have a couple of arguments. We have data underscore path, and this is going to equal hide viewport. And then comma, the next argument is frame equals zero. Okay, so how do we know what the data path should be? So let's go to the uh, Python interactive console. So let me just grab one of these objects. Actually, let me uh, make that visible. Do we have easy BPY? No, I think I need to import that, hold on. Okay, so um, O equals AO. This is a little shortcut in easy BPY to get the active object. So O is one of these segments we have selected. So O dot hide viewport. So this is set to false because we can see it in the viewport, therefore it's set to false. And if I disabled that, then exactly the same thing will give us true. So look, when we have a reference to an object, in this case, it's O, it has child values. If I press O dot and then press tab, it's going to show us all of those child values here. Some of these are variables, some of these are functions, some of these are like weird other pointery things, but these child values are essentially the data path. So we have an object, O down here, light up here, dot keyframe insert, which is a function, data path equals hide viewport. So hide viewport is the data that we are essentially keyframing here on the timeline. Might be a bit confusing, but hopefully you understood that. So we are now setting both the hide in viewport and hide in render to be 
off when it's at frame zero. Okay, so we know that nothing is on now because it's done that for every single object. Every object is turned off at zero. Now we can start adding some random keyframes. But here's the thing, I don't want this to set keyframes and turn on every single light because as we saw earlier, when they're all on at once, it's very intense. Let me turn on the panels as well. Like there's just way too much light going on there, way too much. So I want there to be like a random chance that the lights will be selected to turn on and off. So not all of them, just random ones. So what I'm going to do is get a chance number between 1 and 10. Now you could do it between 0 and 10 if you liked, it doesn't really matter. So remember we have our convenience function r that we set earlier. So chance is going to become a number between 1 and 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay, so now to limit the number of lights being selected, I'm going to do if chance is greater than 7. You can make that condition anything you like, greater than, less than, equal to whatever number you want. So remember, this random number is being generated generated for every light. So there's now like a 30% chance that they'll be active because what's greater than 7, 8, 9, 10. So that's three of them. So when we're looking at any one of these lights, if the random number we're generating is 8, 9 or 10, then we're going to continue and allow that light to turn on throughout the timeline. Now we're going to make a new variable called count and count is essentially, you can think about it like this marker that we're scrubbing through the timeline down here because it's going to count as we're stepping through. So if I make my little diagram, again when we're essentially deciding where the phases should start and end and where to sustain we're going to be looking for it and stepping for it like we're scrubbing through a timeline and then assessing where those keyframes should be placed so this is where a while loop is going to be handy because we want to do all of the keyframe placement while our marker our count is less than the end of the timeline. So, so long as we're still in that timeline space, we can continue our process. So while count is less than end. Remember, we grabbed the end number earlier on, where we did end equals frame end. So basically what this is saying is while zero is less than 90, and that zero is going to increase because we're going to be adding to it now. So we come to this first section where we begin a phase. Remember down here, this is essentially, God, I'm gonna have to keep doing this every time I move the timeline. So this is essentially this bit. We are now at zero because count equals zero, as you can see. So now count plus equals a random number. What that means is we're just going to add a random number to count. And that random number is gonna be between the phase minimum and maximum. So we're exactly here and we're going to add this random value now. So this can be anything between, if we take a look at our numbers, a zero and 75. We're going to assume this is 75, you know, for example. So we've now added 75 to the count. So the count marker is here. And just imagine this marker's at 75. Now we're going to do a check. If count is greater than or equal to the end value, 900. So basically, if we're at the end, we don't want to place a keyframe here. We just want to break. What break does is it means forget this whole loop thing. Let's just break out of it and carry on with the script because we're at the end now. It essentially means we're going to skip this while loop. And because there's nothing after it, we're going to go back and then move on to the next light in the sequence. So it's like a safety measure. Basically, if we're at the end, forget about it. But in this case, we're not at the end. We're at 75. So we go to the else statement. So if we're at the end, break, but else, then we're going to set some keyframes. So now we know we're beginning a phase. We're going to now show the light in the viewport. So we're essentially turning on one of the lights and then showing it in the render as well. Nice. And then we insert the keyframes to say that we're now turning that light on. So just like before, where we're doing light.keyframe insert, data path, hide viewport and hide render, this time instead of having the frame at zero, the frame is going to be count, which is exactly where we are up here. So we basically add a keyframe here to say that we're turning the light on. Okay, so we now know we've begun a phase. Now we need to sustain the phase. So we come to the next section. Again, we do count, which is where we are, plus equals. So we're adding a random number to it. Sustain minimum and maximum. So we're getting a random value between five and 100. So let's draw that in here. We'll assume it's like 100. So because we're adding that random number to it, we know that count has now moved over here in the timeline. And I've, uh, see this is one thing to keep in mind. When you're holding D and you're kind of drawing in here, if you're hovering 
over the text editor here and you're still holding D, it's going to type D, which is a problem. So now I need to fix this. Sustain max, there we go. And again, just like before, we do a check to make sure we're not at the end of the timeline. Because if we started like a new phase down here and then went over the end of the timeline, that's not going to be very helpful, is it? Because, you know, it's past the end. We're not going to see it. So we just check that we're not at the end. And if we are, we're going to break out of this again. And if we're still in the timeline, as we are here, then we're going to do the opposite. So we're going to now make the light invisible in the viewport and the render, basically turning them off. And then we're going to set that keyframe at the count value again. So right here. So essentially at the beginning of the phase, we're turning them on and at the end of the phase, we're turning them off. So that's what the loop does. Now, of course, because this is a while loop and it says while the count is less than end, well, the count here is still less than end, Like we've still got a while to go. So the loop is going to come right back up here and begin again. So because we've still got space, we're going to get another random number for the beginning of a phase, get another random number for the sustain and place that there again. So we're going to keep making keyframes until we reach the end. Now, because the loop is continuously checking to see whether the end has been reached, when it does, it will break out of it. And then we know that assuming this is like the first light we're looking at, L1 or whatever you want to call it. Once that break has been reached, we're going to go back to the beginning of the timeline for the next light. So like L2, for example. So essentially we go back to the for loop here for the next light, come down if it's lucky enough to be in that 30% value then we set the count back to zero which is essentially the same as putting the timeline back to the beginning and then we begin that loop process again so look I just realized I had another d hidden there because I've been using d to do the annotation so just keep that in mind if there are any trailing d's hidden in this text I, am, I apologize for that so then that's basically the main algorithm if you want to think about it this is the main bulk of code which adds the random keyframes and now we've got that function created we can call it so we're going to call it for the rings and for the panels The again, remember, we gathered these earlier. Rings equals get objects from collection and panels equals get objects from collection. So now if I run this, if I press Alt P, you can alternatively go to text and run script. But if you hover over the text editor and press Alt P, you can see that it's going to randomize that. And if we choose any one of these lights, see that it's active in the viewport, which means we can select it. Then you can see the keyframes there. Then we can press Shift A. I think your hotkeys may be different, but my Shift A plays the timeline or you can just press the play button. And then we can watch as the lights turn on and off in the viewport there. Again, because this is cycles and I'm using volumes, it means that I'm also using denoising because if if I turn that off, you can see it's going to be very, very noisy, not very good to preview. So yeah, that is essentially how we take a bunch of like our physical mesh lights and we basically turn them on and off across the timeline randomly to give us this nice variety. And the cool thing is, even if you're not using an animation, this gives you like a nice randomization script just for getting unique lighting for your character. You could also like one thing I was thinking about doing was adding some color variety to this script as well. So it randomly changes colors or has like a gradient of colors across the ring so that's more stuff to investigate and like some of these results are like so cool i love stopping and just like looking at the result here because i think ah this is so cinematic another thing which i forgot to mention is that just for a little bit of added interest we have some particles floating around this is quite simple if i go to the particles collection and click on the particles volume under the modifier stack we have a geometry nodes and if i go to the 3d view here we can take a look at this um in the etk pack so erindale's pack which he graciously let us use for um bygen as well you probably don't need these extra uh, nodes let me just like get rid of some of those because they're left over from one of the presets but basically like this we have a distribute points in volume node again look up the etk package if you want this or get by gen it'll be contained in the wire volume preset in here we take the input mesh which in this case is a cylinder actually if i disable the modifier you can see that here just a primitive cylinder then it's going to randomly create points inside of that cylinder and then we can use the set point radius to scale them down and then use the set material node to give it a basic material which i've called particle so that's a very basic way of getting just like a very simplistic particle field which if we zoom in we can see them kind of floating around in there and because it cycles they are kind of indefinite perfect spheres as well that's pretty cool almost looks like a kind of like planet kind of just suspended there in the void. Anyway, I do have a bit of a surprise up my sleeve because like I said, we've been using EasyBPY and the regular Blend and Python API in combination for this tutorial. God, that's another cool lighting setup as well. I'm just, I love the results of this. Actually, before I show you the surprise, let's do a bit of improv. I want to change the colors. I get excited with it. Let's do this like a bit orangey, the orange and blue. Let's go to the panels. Um, oh, because some of the panels are red and some of them are blue. I thought that would be cool for adding a bit of randomization. Let's see which ones are active. I think those are the two blue ones and one of the red ones there. Let's uh, 
actually like the blue with the orange. Let's do you. Maybe we can increase your strength a bit as well for a bit of extra rim and the volume there. What about the red one? Bit of green? Nah, the red looks pretty good there. But basically, you know, like you can randomize the layout. You can adjust the values, get interesting styles. I just think it's really cool. Anyway, because I'm all about recycling work and modularity and abstraction, I don't like all of this code. And if I wanted to do this again, you know, I would like to simplify it down into like one line or something. Well, in this case, maybe more than one line, but basically in the easy BPY module, if you download it today, I have included a function which does all of this for you automatically. So if I go to my other file to randomize all of the lights in your scene, all you do is this. Just these lines here. You can you can put it all into one line if you like, but I've just expanded the arguments for simplicity. Also, for this file, by the way, I did put all of the lights into one collection rather than two, just to keep it simplistic. So import BPY from easy BPY, import asterisk, which just means all the functions. Then we have a new function, random visibility keyframes. In here we have a few arguments. Objects equals get objects from collection mesh lights, phase min, phase max, sustain minimum and maximum and the chance level. Again, in this case, one means more lights, 10 equals like no lights or, one, or like, you know, 10% of the lights, whatever. But if I press Alt P and do this now, it's going to do exactly the same thing randomizing our lighting and keyframes so when we go to play this back it randomly flashes the lights so instead of doing all of that tutorial that we've done so far you can just do this instead so hopefully you found that useful i'm just going to uh admire some of the lighting setups for a while hopefully you found this interesting and for the very few of you that made it to the end if you put the robot emoji in the comments i'll be able to see who made it this far you are the real og viewers um and if you found this interesting feel free to sign up to my patreon where you can support other projects like this and our other resources and tools i very very much appreciate the support and you can also get your name put permanently on this piece of evolving artwork i call the hall of patreon Patrons. It's basically a way of me celebrating the contributions. And also you can check out some of my other videos on my channel or some of my tools and resources on curtisholderonline slash store. I highly recommend you check out the modular workspaces add-on. That's my recent workflow improvement tool. People seem to really like it. Highly recommend it. So yeah, thanks for watching everyone. Have a fantastic day. Show me your results if you try anything like this and I will see you next time.